estão entregues os prémios e agora vamos para mais um tema disruptivo. E quando falamos de disrupção é inevitável. Um dos temas mais importantes da atualidade é a inteligência artificial. O seu poder, os seus perigos, é um tema obviamente controverso, mas com o qual vamos ter que lidar a partir de agora sempre. Para uns é a última das grandes maravilhas, o admirável mundo novo está mesmo aí. Para outros, até para alguns que a ajudaram a desenvolver, é um perigo se não for regulado e limitado. São, é um debate que tem que ser feito, mas para já vamos ver duas perspectivas diferentes, ou então semelhantes, mas de pessoas que trabalham diretamente com inteligência artificial, a estudam e a desenvolvem. Começamos por David Carmona, que é General Manager Artificial Intelligence and Innovation da Microsoft. David, bem-vindo. Hello, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for coming. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a decade, what a year, and what a day, because uh, times in time with, with AI happens so quickly, right? So uh, today I'm sure that we have like probably a year of advancements in, in AI, right? So uh, what, a, what a pace that we're seeing now in the, in the industry for AI. So what a challenging thing to do here is to try to convey everything that is going on in the AI industry and the future of the cloud in this short amount of time, right? So in a way, it's something that I, that I usually try to, to do when explaining what is going on with AI today is looking a little bit back, right? It's looking at the past 10 years or a decade or so of breakthroughs on AI. And this is just some of them, right? So you can see some of the major breakthroughs that we have witnessed in AI for the past 10 years. And, and they go, as you can see, all over different domains uh, you, you have. In 2016, for example, Microsoft Research uh, was able to achieve human parity on things like object recognition. So identifying an object in a picture better than a human, right? That was 2016. Then after that, you have the same thing for speech recognition, uh, reading comprehension, uh, speech synthesis, general language understanding. So many different tasks and domains where with a lot of effort and focus, we were able to accomplish a huge milestone for AI. But if you look deeper into each of these examples, what is behind each of these accomplishments is first, it's a very specialized team, 100% focus on that particular breakthrough, right? So for example, the first one, object recognition. So really, really expert people, researchers, working on achieving that goal by creating a very specific architecture for, for example, for an algorithm, a neural network that was very specialized on that particular task with a data set, in this case, for example, about images that are labeled with, this is a dog, this is a cat, on hundreds of thousands of pictures, right? So you see the pattern here. For each of these, it was fully specialized set of resources from people to the data set to the algorithms to make that happen. If there's one summary, one liner for summarizing what is going on today with AI, is that this is no longer the case. So the new algorithms for AI, what they're able to accomplish is that level of state-of-the-art performance, but on a much broader variety of tasks and domains with the same model. This is just an example coming from the paper, the technical report paper for GPT-4, where you can see this model being asked to deliver on a particular test. And you have, you see the small font, you see a huge variety of domains here, from biology to chemistry to law uh, to any other test that you can see out there, and is performing amazingly well in most cases above the 90% percentile on compared with, with humans on those, on those tests without one single change. So the same model without any change is able to perform that well across all that variety of different tasks and domains. So you see the main difference in here. It's not that it's able to do these things, the most important thing, is that it's able to do this variety of things without any change. So you don't longer require to have one specialized set of expertise, tools, 
algorithms, data sets for a task to deliver that task. You can do that now across all those tasks with one model. And by the way, the same thing, for example, if you read, this is a paper published by Microsoft Research where we, we took an approach, a more scientific approach at what are the limits of these models, right? And you can see the results in that paper. One of the things that we did was actually to, uh, to ask the model to deliver coding tasks, right? So explaining a challenge, a coding challenge, and then having the model deliver on that challenge by writing the code. And for that, we use, there's a test that a lot of organizations out there, most of the cloud vendors, uh, including Microsoft, are using uh, this test for their hiring process. And it was actually, this model was actually able to pass that test that is used in many corporations as a hiring process for developers, right? So you see the sense of the magnitude of the, 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 the power of, of, this, of these models. So what is behind these three things are happening right now that are enabling this new paradigm for AI? The first one is a new concept of model. So again, not domain specific, but what we call foundation model. Foundation because they are a share model, a foundation model that you can use for many different tasks. These models, one of the things that make that possible is that they are trained on AS supercomputers. So one important thing that, that we were able to accomplish with these models is that they can be parallelized when they are trained. And the moment that you can parallelize the training of a model, then you can use an AS supercomputer with hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of GPUs and CPUs to train that model accomplishing, being able to create these massive, large models that are able to perform so well across different tasks. And then the third thing is that instead of the approach that I was explaining before for things like vision, where you have a label data set with images of dogs and cats, instead of that, we use entire data sets of unsupervised, meaning not labeled data. For example, the entire archive of the internet for the past years. All that data, petabytes of data, that is used to train these models. That is what makes possible the power of this model. Now, what is the difference here? So if you compare with traditional AI, the one that we, most of us are doing uh, today, it has this pattern. It's the same pattern for any AI problem that you want to solve, right? You have a particular task in a particular domain. You have to create a different model. So you need a data set for that domain. If you are doing, I don't know, forecast prediction, you need a data set for forecast prediction. Then you train a model, and you can only use that model for forecast prediction. You want a different task or a different domain, you need a new model. Now, what these models have is that, yes, you need a lot of data to train these models. But once you have that, you can use that model. You can customize that model to be used in any task or domain. That's the power of these models. But what is even more interesting is that to accomplish that, to use a model on a different task than the one that it was trained for, what you use is natural language. So you don't need to customize these models using you know, deep knowledge of architectures or techniques on, on machine learning. You just use your natural language to tell the model what to do. That's, that concept is called few shot learning, and it became very popular with models like GPT-3 in the past, where you can approach the model and just explain, just ask the model, hey, model, I want to translate English to French, and here's a couple of examples. That few shot learning. And the model will be able to perform that task. Or you have one shot where you basically tell the model what to do, one example, and it's able to perform that task. And nowadays, we're seeing a lot of zero shot, and that's the one that I'm sure that you have used, where you just tell the model what to do, and the model will answer, will reply to you, and perform that task. So that customization you just did, you just customize a model to your particular task just using your language. The model, in this case, was not trained with labels, data sets of translation between English and French. It was able to learn that by using this raw data. So what we're seeing now, we are talking a lot about language models for that. That was the inception of this, the language models. It was the first domain that we saw the power of this technology. But what we're seeing is that the same technique can be used for other modalities. Modalities even combine them. So you have language understanding, but then you also have image generation, or video generation, or code generation and explanation. So instead of text, you can use code to train this model 
and the model will be able to create code or explain a piece of code. Or even we are seeing huge potential to not only understand for these models to understand the language of nature, the language of humans, but also the language of nature. So things of chemistry, molecules, atoms, these are also graphs that you can feed into these models, train them to perform tasks like predicting a property of a molecule, or finding a molecule for a particular property, or predicting the interaction between molecules. So that has huge potential for things like uh, drug discovery, or sustainability, or food supply. So on the business side, so let's turn a little bit into the business. What is the impact of this new paradigm for AI in the business. And the example that I can use is actually Microsoft. So this is the way that we approach AI in Microsoft in the past, right? So we have different applications, so from uh, Dynamics to Teams to Bing to all our, our productivity suite, et cetera. And then you have different tasks that are powered by AI in those applications. So the approach that we had to take was having one model for each of those tasks in each of those applications. So every team had to create, had to find a data set, train a model to deliver that particular feature. Now, with this concept of foundation models, what we can have is AI as a platform. So think of it as the same paradigm that we already have for software in the cloud, but for AI. You can use AI as a platform. You can use the same foundation model and then apply that for each of your businesses, applications, and tasks. So the power behind this is not only the power of the model itself, but think about the scalability, the scalability of that. right? So what you can do is to scale AI across your entire organization because you no longer require to have such a tedious work for each of the models. So think about the, the possibilities of that. And in our case, in Microsoft, we deliver the same functionality, the same platform that we use internally. We also expose it as part of Azure. So your company can be using those models, those foundation models as a service, so you can customize them for your own business requirements. Taking one step further, so if you take this to the extreme, it's not only business units using AI for their, uh, for their tasks and for their business challenges and opportunities. It's also employees. So it's how every employee, because now we can use this AI with language to co-reason with that AI back and forth, we can effectively reason with a copilot by our side, right? So it's having a helper that can help me co-reason on top of this amount of knowledge that there's outside and also in my company. It's like transforming the concept of information worker into an intelligence worker. And that can go from tasks like your daily tasks, so your daily life tasks, to be more productive at work, to even think of professions like researchers that are, uh, they, they have to co-reason with AI, they can co-reason with AI on top of the knowledge around that uh, challenges like sustainability, uh, global health, or food supply, that now you can co-reason with AI to take that knowledge to the next level and make progress in the sciences behind them. So one example that I like to use, because it was one of the first, this was two years ago that we, that we delivered uh, this feature, it's called uh, GitHub Copilot, and because it was two years ago, we have data that is showing us a little bit of the impact of that concept of having a copilot that is working with you on any task. Right? In this case, that can apply to any function, but in this case, it was the developer function. And we see, of course, that they are way faster on how they develop, but not only that, they're also more productive, but what is even more interesting is that by serving those developers that are using uh, uh, GitHub Copilot, they actually say that they are more satisfied at work because they can focus on the problems that really matter. And it enables them to scale to a different level of delivery. So at the end, what this can enable is you really step back from all the buzz, from all the noise that is going on with AI. If you really take a step back and look at the impact into business that we can take today, is that AI is moving from being something in the center of this onion, right? This onion technology units, that's where AI was focused before. It was like for people like me, I consider myself a technologist, we were kind of the bottlenecks, right? So everything has to go through us. 
We are changing that. Instead of that, we technologists are providing a platform for then the business to innovate on top of AI. So that is bringing AI to every process. That's the first thing that we're going to see with this new paradigm for AI. The second thing is not stopping there, is that AI can go beyond the business unit and get into every employee and every function, right? So that's the next super important impact of this technology. So we will see every function from sales to marketing to HR being redefined thanks to this technology. And then the last one, and not less important, is that this will increase our responsibility on this technology. Because it's not going to be a technology that is going to be constrained or isolated. It's going to be a technology that will be part of every function and activity in any organization. So that requires us to be even more uh, careful with the challenges that come associated with AI. And it's not something that can be an afterthought. It is something that has to be processed, that has to be addressed in every step of this big transformation that is going to happen in any corporation. Thank you very much. Ficaram aqui as pistas da Microsoft. Vamos agora saber qual é a perspectiva da Google neste assunto que está, obviamente, a centrar as atenções do mundo inteiro, literalmente e de todos os governos deste planeta pela sua importância. Ficou a perspectiva da Microsoft, vamos olhar para a perspectiva da Google, outro espanhol, Pablo Carlier, bem-vindo, Head of Data Analytics and AI from Google. Pode, sim. Welcome. Boa tarde. Está agora. The clicker? Perdão. Ah. Boa tarde. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, a great pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Pablo. I look after the data analytics business and artificial intelligence in Spain and Portugal for Google Cloud. And before we start, I would love to run a short experiment with you. Please raise your hand if you have ever created an artificial intelligence image yourself. You can see that roughly, thank you very much, like roughly 10%, no, roughly, maybe a little bit more, maybe 20% of people raise their hand. How many of you have actually generated a video with artificial intelligence yourself? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven hands. We'll come back to that later. I'm going to ask you now to run a separate experiment now. Please close your eyes, all right? And let's go back one million years ago. And imagine the first human picking up the first branch on fire for the first time. What was going through their mind when discovering this new technology? Probably two or three things going on through their minds. How to cook my food, how to defend my family from an animal, how to bring light into my cave. Now you can open your eyes and try to imagine what the potential impact of that technology could have been. Hundreds of thousands of years later is almost unimaginable for them. They could have not foreseen that this same technology would bring the Industrial Revolution and the steam machine. And 100 years later, it would also be the source of the age of information with electricity, right? By the way, all these images are artificial intelligence generated. This had much more impact six months ago when no one was accustomed to it. But that tells you an idea of the pace of innovation. We are no longer impressed by this. Let me give you a bit of background for myself. I joined this company almost six years ago. It's going to be six years ago in a couple of days. And one thing that impressed me very much when I joined was seeing our CEO, Sundar Pichai, saying that artificial intelligence and machine learning had the potential to be as transformative as electricity or fire. Wow, that was very ambitious and bold. And I remember thinking, that's a tall order. We look at it a bit, a bit differently now, right? We start to see that promise, but it's still very hard for us to understand what the potential of this technology can be down the line. What we know is that we have been infusing this technology in everything that we build for the past decades. So we have been going over this journey of understanding how to address the challenges that we have as an organization to fulfill our mission, which is to organize all the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. 
And we found out that it was no longer possible for us to do that the traditional way. We had to invent new breakthrough technology to address these great challenges. And six years ago, roughly after I entered the company, but it has no relationship whatsoever with me joining, there was a discovery that was made inside of Google. It was attention. And this famous paper, Attention is All You Need, was the source of the new architecture of artificial intelligence models, these new transformers that were the birth of the large language models that have given us these new generative AI capabilities that we are now witnessing and that inspire us to look at the next page of, our, of technology. And when we look at our evolution from the, tr the initial transformer architecture and BERT to BARD and PALM and the languages that we have right now, the huge capabilities that we have in front of us right now, what we see is that we have transitioned from very specific custom-made models for each task and each modality to the capabilities of working more closely to the way our brains work, with the ability to understand concepts across every single modality, be it text, images, sound, video, you name it. It was when working on translating from any language to any language that we discovered that we could create abstractions and allow them to connect amongst themselves to give us new capabilities. And that was the spark that ignited this new revolution that we are seeing right now. That's what took us from the basic capabilities we had some years ago, arithmetic, basic question and answering, to what we are seeing right now, complex logical reasoning, even common sense. Where's the limit to this? How have we, how we, have we been working with these technologies? You've all been working with all of these without knowing it for many years. Because these same capabilities to relate video, images, text, and train these massive models with massive amount of data is what have given us now the chance to bring magic to everyday life. Because when you design a system that understands what's in an image, that is not identifying a set of pixels, but knowing that this is a person, then that, that is able to remove an unwanted element from an image and substitute it and generate a new object that makes sense. And if we apply this to any other processes across Maps or YouTube or our enterprise processes, we see the potential of these technologies to help us in solving the biggest challenges that we have ahead of us as a species, right? We're preventing how floods are going to behave by understanding how topography and maps and water behaves. We're preventing wildfires. We're understanding how to help in many other use cases that are pushing the barriers of what mathematics and science are able to do. Another question, who here has heard about AlphaFold and the problem of protein solving and, and, and protein folding? One, two, three. Let me summarize it for you, OK? A protein is a chain of amino acids that folds in a specific way. It's like a nano machine built by nature. It's very hard to predict how that chain is going to fold itself. And the way it folds describes its properties. That's crucial for material design, for drug discovery, for medicine, for many applications. But it is a hugely complicated problem. It actually took years of very specialized scientists to understand how one protein is going to fold. We are not able to describe how 200 million proteins, effectively every single protein in the world, is going to fold. And we have open sourced that thanks to AlphaFold. It's paying attention, following these models, to a specific process that we have made huge advancements in new fields of science and applying this also to things like nuclear fusion or understanding how new fields of mathematics are going to look like. But we are also powering millions of business with this technology behind the scenes, infusing every product that we build. Now, this is truly a new era, a new business opportunity, and a new opportunity for the whole society. But when we look at it, we also see that consumers and enterprises are looking at this very differently. When we look at it from our perspective as a user, we're looking at something that can be helpful, something that can be assistive, and can help us with routine tasks like how to plan my holiday, how to start writing a poem, or a subject uh, work that I need to do for school, or maybe answer an, an interesting question 
And we're more interested in the creativity side of it than to the accuracy and factfulness of it. But enterprises are looking at very different use cases, right? You need to control the source and truthfulness of data. You need to make sure that you have the right privacy levels and controls. You need to make sure that you're applying these processes to your existing data processes and applications. This is not a toy. This is something that you're going to put your business processes on top of. You need to have a solid foundation. This is what we've been offering on top of what we call our Vertex AI platform. It's our enterprise platform on which we're building three tiers of capabilities of artificial intelligence for every company. We're building the best platform with the best infrastructure and accelerators like foundation models so the artificial intelligence wizards, the Gandalfs of the, of the machine learning world, are able to use these resources in an effective way. But we need to democratize the access to these technologies, right? So we're building on top of that an API layer so every developer in the world is actually able to use these new capabilities of these new models and apply them to their business processes and accelerating some use cases like enterprise search or conversational agents and customer care or product recommendations are packaged solutions and capabilities that we are offering to companies. And then eventually, we're building ready-made products ready to use to address some use cases, but all of them are founded in the same responsible research, in the same grounded, factual base of working that we have been infusing to prevent bias, to make sure that we are socially responsible, and that boost the capabilities that we are now including also in every collaboration tool that we have. This is about simplifying our day jobs. This is about accelerating the talent of human individuality and our creativity, and helping us with our daily tasks. That's why we're involving all these technologies as well in every collaboration tool that we have to summarize conversations, to be creative in the way that we are writing in a different tone our messages, or summarizing our meetings, or helping us with our day-to-day -day jobs, but also exposing them for solutions that can support our business processes. Imagine that you can provide a customized experience to your customers when they join you for the first time and then visit your website, and you can generate content on the fly to guide them through your offerings and provide a more human, more assistive, more helpful, and friendlier experience for them with the simplicity of just calling an API or just drag and drop building a new application without requiring super specialized capabilities. This is the power that these new technologies bring into us, the ability to generate content. And by the way, these kind of videos were what I was talking about before. I am sure that when I ask this question six months from now, everyone will raise their hands and it will be old news. This is the pace at which we are innovating right now. And we are just starting to imagine how all these capabilities are going to keep accelerating our time to value, are going to keep helping us go faster from idea to execution. We are supporting companies right now, saving millions of dollars, millions of, millions of gallons of fuel in optimizing the routes, in supporting them in preventing risks and multiplying with orders of magnitude more capability, their ability to analyze data and prevent fraud. We are even building more sustainable processes to analyze their impact on the supply chain and the environment. The cloud is helping us be a catalyst of all this transformation through to the ability to analyze data quickly, bring more sustainable transformation to these processes thanks to the way we run the cloud and also boosting this with the capability that only a specialized infrastructure can give us. Now, responsibility in the way we develop this is the key for success for this company, for this organization, but also for this society. We need to make sure that even from the research starting point, we open up the way that we are collaborating and we subject our research and our publications to the most strict scientific requirements, that we also work in reviewing the use cases that we are applying this technology to, to make sure that we are being socially responsible and we are not applying this technology to applications that should not be pursued, and also providing transparency, explainability, and the ability to control the privacy of the way you're training these models to make sure that what you offer to the market are responsible offerings, that we are not gambling with these technologies but providing capabilities we got trust on. And this is where we see the future going. So now, if, if we imagine now, and, and we look 
at what's going to happen in the next decades, in the next years, in the next months. What is ahead of us? I see three main pillars there. One is that we need to be both bold and responsible. Bold in the way that we explore, imagine, and dream new applications of these technologies, knowing that it's going to be even more groundbreaking, even more exciting when we transition from digital experiences to experiences that disappear, that are ambient computing, that support us embedded in our day-to-day -day lives and that are embodied in autonomous systems that go beyond the screen, beyond the phone, beyond the computer, and just can navigate the environment the, way, the same way we do it, but also do it responsibly, making sure that we provide a secure, trusted platform so you can build on top of it. Second, that innovation must be open. We have a huge track record of open sourcing over every innovation that we have built. We believe that the future must be open. That's why we are offering both Google's internal innovation in the form of these models that we have built, but also any other open source model in our platform. And we have more open source models than anyone else has models, but we believe that we must be able to combine every open innovation in the world, also to attract that talent pool of people that are going to be boosting our acceleration in this space, and that's going to be surrounded in the open source market. We think that open source is going to be the way to go there. And the third one is that people is going to be driving this transformation. And this is your teams. This is your culture. This is your processes and your applications. And we are going to have to make sure that we have the right enablement to the people that work in our companies, that they understand the implications of these technologies, that they can dream and have the autonomy of thinking as product owners and building responsible but amazing experiences within the organization or to work with other organizations to make sure that we maximize the capabilities that these new technologies are going to offer us, but we have a solid ground to build on top of. In the end, it's very hard for us to know where we're going. We only know a couple of things that are going to be certain. One is that this time, it's not going to take us thousands of years to find out what the consequences are going to be and where we're going to take us as a species. And second, that now it's the time for us to imagine, to dream, and to build these new experiences together. Thank you very much.